we are back on the Zero Hour. I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Escow. And I always look forward to speaking to my next guest. It's been a little while. Uh, Major Danny Scherzen is a historian, a writer, as his, uh, as his um, form of address might uh, lead you to believe. He is a former major in the United States Army, former instructor at West Point, combat veteran in, I believe, both Iraq and Afghanistan, and the author of a new book I wanted to talk to him very much about, a book called a True History of the United States. The subtitle, which is my favorite part, is Indigenous Genocide, Racialized Slavery, Hypercapitalism, Militarist Imperialism, and Other Overlooked Aspects of American Exceptionalism. Danny Scherzer, welcome back to the program. Oh, thanks for having me. It is a mouthful, the uh, subtitle, but so is American History. It sure is, and you must have had fun coming up with that uh, that uh, subtitle. You know, it was actually, uh, it was actually my publishers who came up with it. They were like, I think I'm just going to take the thesis of the book and put it in the subtitle, but it kind of works. Well, no, it definitely works. And a lot of these chapters, you got a ton of chapters in here. You got great mentions from, uh, from people like Chris Hedges, Bob Shear, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, as well you should. Um, but um, a lot of these pieces, Perhaps all of them were taken from the Truth Digger history series you did on truthdig.com, right? Yeah, that's how it started. Um, you know, I had, had a conversation with Bob Shear, of course, you know, kind of one of those uh, legendary journalists from the old school. And I had said that I had taught this stuff at West Point and I was describing how, you know, it, I was teaching sort of an alternative history, but an accurate one. And he was so surprised and he said, if I thought if, if our readers knew what was being taught by some people at West Point, that would be interesting to them. And so he said, how about you just write me like a, you know, I told him I taught 38 lessons every semester. He said, what if you write me a chapter for each uh, and publish them? This book is a, a kind of a, you know, a combination of all those chapters, but with some additional material and transitions and a new prologue and epilogue. Well, before we dive into the book, which I'm, I'm really enjoying and I have a few notes on, but hence glasses, but um, before we get into that, I guess I'm sure my listeners will, and, and viewers will want to know, uh, okay, uh, you know, this is certainly a, a contrary take to certainly a lot of what we've uh, been taught in school. I'm still laughing about your characterization of the Puritan uh, settlers, which is basically, you know, they, it sounds great, but if you met them on a street corner handing out leaflets, you'd, you'd cross the street, right, to get away from them. Um, but so it is clearly a different kind of take, you know, similar to the sensibilities we share. Uh, how did it go over with your uh, cadets at West Point? Well, that was really interesting. It went over way better than people might expect, actually. Um, look, most people think of West Point cadets as like uh, hyper-conservative automatons. And and like like certain stereotypes, I mean, there is a little bit of truth in that. I mean, they tend to come from upper middle class backgrounds in uh, especially, you know, they come from every congressional district, but the, the more heavily weighted ones are down in Texas, uh, you know, the Mountain West, the Deep South. They definitely come in with sort of like a paltry pageantry, patriotic view of American history, because that's what they've been taught. That's what their family background is. But, you know, everything that I was teaching and everything that's in this book is within the, you know, to the extent that it exists is within the consensus of serious scholars. And so it, I found that if you delivered the truth with, you know, a, a bit of charisma, a, a decent, you know, uh, presentation, I could get, I was pretty excitable in the classroom. So I jump on top of a table, you know, I do my best Robin Williams impression. You know, at the end of the semester, I would get reviews and they give anonymous reviews. They have to give you like a, a rating and then they get comments. And I would say it was weighted nine to one, very positive to, you know, the occasional comment that would say, you know, my teacher's a communist, you know, but it was it was mostly positive. I, I think that I just felt like these these kids, right, these cadets, uh, I taught freshmen and, and this panned out, sadly, are going to go kill and die potentially for this country. So wouldn't it be obscene if they didn't know uh, the 
good, the bad, and the ugly. And so I presented it that way. A lot of the instructors did. I mean, not every instructor gave such a progressive take, but a surprising number did. And they actually were pretty positive about it for the most part. I mean, there were a lot of questions, and I will say, we can get into it later if you'd like, the two most, the two lessons where I got the most pushback were like the Alamo, Texas Revolution. Oh, the man. Texans lost their mind when I said that the Alamo was about slavery, which uh -huh. it partly was, and then the Civil War. Those two were, very, and that was the Southern kids, very much more pushback because they really have like a cultural attachment to the myth rather than the reality. And this book's a lot about deflating myths. And kids from Texas, man, I'm telling you, that Alamo myth is strong. Well, last week on the show, we covered the slavery, a little bit, the slavery aspect of um, the war with Mexico. Name, And we weren't on the right side of that one, as you well know. Um, also, uh, and, and then we'll jump into the, the book. It, you know, it's interesting because it was in the news recently, I, I, and I thought of you, uh, uh, you know, first of all, people don't realize there are... are lot of intelligent people in the military who question things and who are interested in things like history and you know uh, and we also have this view that the leadership or officers are all automatons too i mean they may be career oriented that's another conversation but but uh, you know they a lot of them ain't stupid and and i've, I've talked to some of them but um the news reports recently about uh, general milley uh, and uh, Representative Gates, uh, or however it's pronounced, I should know, uh, reacting to the woke comment Matt Gates posed to him, uh, and he said, in case you, you know, I'm sure you read it, but he says, I want to understand, I want to, General Milley said, I want to understand, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, I want to understand white rage and I'm white. Uh, I've read Mao Zedong, I've read Karl Marx, I've read Lenin, that doesn't make me a communist. What is wrong with understanding, having some situational understanding about the country for which we are here to defend? Okay, you know, which we are here to defend, but okay. Um, so did you, when you saw that, I'm assuming you saw that, did you have any thoughts about it? Well, sure. I, I think it's very interesting sometimes that the, the right, you know, the right wing in, in Congress or, or the pundits are generally more upset about things like identity politics and uh, the woke stuff within the military than the generals in the military are, than the officers in the military are. It's like they're more outraged. You know, they hate outrage culture, but they're the, for the biggest snowflakes of all. Right. Uh, and they get outraged. And, and I've often thought, you know, why, why don't you let, if you, if you really believe that the military should be adulated on this level, fetishized almost, which I think is problematic, then, then why wouldn't you sort of let them make their own decisions, right? And the truth is that the United States military, uh, it doesn't exactly reflect the demographics of America, especially in the combat units. We've talked about this on the show before. It's weighted sure. towards uh, white males from the Deep South, the Mountain West, and the Rust Belt. But overall, the U.S. military reflects America a bit more. And so, you, you know, you, we can't have the U.S. military be a time capsule to 1955 like someone like Mac Gates wants it to be. And that's not going to work because it'll be a recruiting crisis. Right. You're not going to get uh, the increasingly, uh, you know, slanted towards people of color demographics of America to go into the recruiting station and fill out this military that we're using a bit too much if you make them feel unwelcome. And I say, like, I'm not about deferring to the generals on everything, but if they're not as outraged, then maybe we should just give it a rest. And, and that, I just that's how I always feel about that. I'm just exhausted by it. And, you know, I, that's really well said, Danny, and, and, and I guess I would add to it that, you know, I think we're engaging in too many confrontations and combat situations around the world, but given that that is the job of the military, if they're going to go into a country in a, 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 you know, in a combat capacity or occupation capacity or anything else, which I would rather they did dramatically less of, but that's a policy decision. If they're going to do it, I would prefer a well-educated military that knows a little bit about the country they're going into. And for that matter, going back to your book, knows a little bit about the country they're serving when they do it. Um, so, and the only other thing that the Millie, uh, 
Uh, and uh, by the way, I thought he did very well, but uh, the only other thing the Milley exchange uh, reminded me of was, and I think we've talked about this too, you and I on the show, uh, you know, when I, when H.R. McMaster many years ago, uh, now General McMaster wrote his book, Dereliction of Duty, about, uh, if I recall correctly, basically about uh, the failure of military leadership during the Vietnam War and so on to accurately inform civ civilian leadership of uh, the, way, the true course of the war and what that means, uh, obligations under the military code. But it seems to me that H.R. McMaster and all of these guys have done the same thing with Afghanistan. What do you well, think? You know, H.R. McMaster is an interesting figure. So he taught history at West Point as well. I mean, he's uh -huh. kind of a legend in the history department. I mean, we, his desk still has a little plaque saying that used to be H.R. McMaster's desk when he was a captain and a major like I was when I taught there. And like, if, ever, if you get that office, you're like lucky. Um, I always had a lot of respect for him. I, I've lost a lot of that because I yeah. just, I think a lot of his positions within the Trump administration, and I think his most recent book is just wildly hawkish and really goes against everything that he stood for for most right. of his life. But that being said, it's really interesting because he wins the Silver Star in the Gulf War. He's the hero of the Gulf War. Like the Battle of 73 Easting was all that. But, he, you know, he chooses when he gets back. Uh, to go teach at West Point, and he writes this book, which is like built around his PhD dissertation. And he was told at the time, you know, which I think is relevant, that this was going to be a career ender. That yeah. essentially, even criticizing generals 30 years ago, or at that point, only 20 years ago, was going to be a career ender. And it is not an accident that he, that he topped out at three stars. In fact, he was passed over for his first general star twice because he was sort of considered a maverick. And yeah. General Petraeus, this is true, flew back from Baghdad to sit on the board, his final chance to get three looks to get general, and went in there and basically put pressure on him and said, we got to promote this guy. He's smart. He thinks he's a critical thinker. And I think that's very instructive about how like military uh, promotions and leadership works. But you know, I think his, I wish he would apply the lessons from his book, Dereliction of Duty, to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and come to the conclusions he came to in Vietnam. Yeah, that was, that was my conclusion. By the way, I will say as a proud family note, my parents were at some function or dinner where William Westmoreland was the featured speaker, General Westmoreland, during the Vietnam War. And of the hundreds of people in the room, the only one who didn't stand up of uh, for Westmoreland was my mother, which infuriated my father. But I think history has absolved my mother on this one. Uh, uh, maybe I'm being unfair to Westmoreland. I don't know. Um, but let's talk about your book, Danny Shirts. And for people who are uh, might want to read it, I get these emails sometimes. Why don't you spell your guest's name? So it's Danny Shirson or Daniel Shirson, S J U R S E N. And again, uh, the book, A True History of the United States. Let's start with the title. A True History of the United States suggests strongly that people have been taught an untrue history of the United States. Is that true? Is it true that we've been taught an untrue? Uh, I, I think I think it uh, it is true that for the most part, um, even up to today, most people have been given a sort of sanitized version of American history or a circumscribed one uh, one that lacks nuance. The title is um, is purposely provocative uh, in this sort of postmodern era uh, of questioning truth, of questioning facts. Which there's some there, there there's something to be said for that. I mean, what is the truth is a difficult thing. Um, what I was trying to do is bridge the gap between, as I say in the preface, what scholars have long known and what people are taught. What students, non-experts, what are lay people taught? And, and I hoped that, you know, I could use my pen and any skill that I have at this to sort of give, even though it's long, because American history is large, a digestible version of the past that gives kind of a warts and all history of the United States. And it's meant as a corrective. And, and that's a bold and, ambi and ambitious project, no doubt. And one that I ultimately can't weigh in on. I can't give the last, you know, sort of uh, statement on that. I'm sure that I, I, I misfired in certain areas or I, you know, I didn't do the full job, but I really tried. I mean, it was a labor of love. It's one of the hardest projects I've ever done. Uh, but the short answer, though, is that I think we have absolutely been given a sanitized version of our past that does not uh, critically grapple 
with the original sins of American history, uh, the four of which I sort of coined are in the subtitle, you know, racialized slavery, indigenous genocide, hyper-capitalism or materialism, as Martin Luther King called it. And then, of course, probably most provocatively, uh, militarized imperialism. Uh, and I argue that America has been an empire from the first, in fact, before it was a country, when we were still the colonies. So, and let's talk about this. And let me say, first of all, for my audience who has not yet seen the book, most of them, I'm sure, uh, you did, you made a great choice, and I'm sure this is based on your 38 lessons and then chapters, but I think the relative shortness of each chapter uh, makes the book very readable. And I think it's it's written in a very human voice and, you know, warm tone. Uh, and I don't mean warm affectionate. I mean warm, almost like audio, you know, warm. And uh, I think that really helps, too. It's a human book about human beings and their foibles as they stumble about building a country and building an empire and, you know, one foot in front of the other. So I really enjoyed that about it. And of course, with the emphasis on the imperialism, as you said, um, let's talk about, there were a couple aspects of it I really wanted to talk about. Let's do, kind of take them linearly. Uh, it starts with, and I'm sorry about the glasses, but I got a C to do this. Um, first of all, as you point out in the introduction, Americans' basic historical knowledge keeps reaching new and obscene lows. Um, but then you talk about the fact that every nation state has an origin myth, a comforting tale of trials, tribulations, and triumphs that form the foundation of imagined communities, which is a phrase historians have used, um, the self-proclaimed indispensable nation is as prone to exaggerated origin myths as any society in human history. Uh, so let's start there. The Pilgrims. I mentioned how amusing I found it. Um, you know, that they, they seem like saints until you think about what they must have been like to hang out with, basically. <laughs> right? I mean... It was, it was meant to be a provocative chapter. I mean, I think I, at some point I may have said something like, uh, we're talking about about ISIS on, you know, um, you know, right. Massachusetts Bay. Um, right. and you with know, ISIS with buckles on their shoes. Right, right. <laughs> uh, ISIS with buckles on their hats. And, but I think right. the, 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 the juxtaposition of Jamestown and, you know, Plymouth Rock are really important because if you think about it, um, all of our students, and I'm talking children, including my four-year-old, right? They perform, we perform our origin myth every Thanksgiving. I mean, literally school plays, summer camp sort of plays of the pilgrims. Like, why do we choose Massachusetts? I mean, it's 13 years after Jamestown is settled, but we chose that one. And that was a conscious collective decision. We like the idea of these, you know, poor people who were put upon because of their religion and then they come here and they like found this new Israel. And what we forget, of course, is that these were wildly intolerant zealots who were, you know, putting women to death for witchcraft and banning folks who even were dissenting Protestants from their dissenting Protestantism. But we forget that the real, the real first permanent or lasting colony is in Jamestown. And I wonder why, actually, I don't wonder why, uh, it's actually quite clear why that's not the chosen origin myth, because that colony nearly fails. It is an it is an incompetent venture, which is literally a corporate sort of uh, you know charter company venture, full of aristocrats looking for gold and the Northwest Passage. They bring too many chiefs and no worker bees, no farmers, no women. They choose a malarial swamp for their first location. And then almost all of them starve to death or get disease. And one guy eats his wife in the first major winter, what they call the starving time. So they brought I mean, at least one woman. Right, uh, right, right. Well, th this was, what, yeah, they came on the second, they came on the, they came on the second or third ship. They brought oh. some women over, but it's very interesting because, you know, that was, that's the real truth of why folks came originally to the United States. This is a corporate venture. It's largely a mercenary venture. It's it's based on extractive uh, pre-capitalism. 
And we don't like that story because it would be a lot more awkward to perform incompetence and cannibalism uh, at your kindergarten Thanksgiving play than to do the pilgrim story. But even the pilgrim story, what's forgotten is these were genocidaires. These were people who wiped out women and children at the first sign of trouble if they were Native American and then said God told them to. And they were proud of it. That's the origin. We have to be real with it. Right. So first of all, Jamestown is exactly how I picture Elon Musk's first Mars expedition going. You know, I mean, I think it's getting the same way. Cannibalism and, you know, these rich guys eating each other. Um, But not everything has a happy ending like that. So I'm not sure. Uh, But uh, this phrase of yours, uh, uh, first, I want to say, you know, we talk about this. uh, We talk about the pilgrims as we always say they went and seek in search of religious freedom, but they weren't pursuing religious freedom at all. I mean, were they? I mean, what they wanted was freedom to oppress others according to their own standards rather than being oppressed according to the standards of others. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, they wanted to form a Christian caliphate. I mean, if you think about it, it's not that different. I mean, they, they, they did feel persecuted and there was some persecution in Europe, but they didn't want like a free and open society for everyone where they just happen to practice along with others. They wanted to create a new Zion. I mean, they, they really, and they said this and they said, you know, uh, we shall be a city upon a hill. And everyone says, oh, what a great phrase. And then Reagan, you know, uh, says it and repeats it over and over again, but no one remembers the next part. And the next part is, be you know because we have god on our side i'm summarizing we shall be you know as strong that we can kill 10 of our enemies and we're going to basically wipe out the heathen uh so it is not ludicrous to say that what they were really looking for was to carve out like a christian caliphate where they could oppress others and yes they could practice their religion freely but not anyone else especially if they were brown and indigenous you know who lived in a city on a hill sauron uh right. from lord of the you know he could like destroy right. But Mortar was a city on a hill, yeah. Right. <laughs> but, oh boy, I'm going to get in trouble with somebody now. But, uh, and let me just read, because I, I enjoyed your writing on this one so much. It all sounds harmonious, idyllic, even, but something lurked between the surface, something dark and unpleasant to modernize. These were fundamentalist zealots. Then you write, uh, these insufferable millenarian Calvinists held themselves in shockingly high esteem. Yeah, well, you know, if we think about history as a kind of planting of DNA in a society, in a country that, you know, that gets carried on generation to generation, sometimes in certain forms, then I think that's a, a, that shockingly high self-esteem is a DNA that continues to this day, don't you? I mean, I think that we still call it th- ourselves the exceptional nation and the exceptional people as somehow as if somehow we were not human like everybody else and subject to the same character defects and everything else. Uh, so we still have this sort of undercurrent, and I'm obviously I'm not speaking of every individual, but collectively our politics certainly seems to have this uh, unwarrantedly high self-esteem in it, don't you think? Oh, I, I've said many times, I mean, I think the, the the core original sin that really encapsulates the other four is American exceptionalism or the notion of exceptionalism. Exceptionalist nations are dangerous. I mean, most ethnic cleansers in, a, in world history are, have an exceptionalist view of themselves, exceptionalist and universalist. I mean, right. a lot of crimes are permissible when you start to think you're exceptional. And, right. and this is a dangerous thing. I mean, think about this. If a human being... One person is an exceptionalist, you know, it has exceptionalism and thinks that they're like this like messianic figure that has a mission to we that's a diagnosable condition. (laughs) But if a collective nation is exceptionalist, then we're that's just patriotism. And we never really grapple with that. I think I think it is it is um, I think it's a condition. I think it's a disease, exceptionalism, and it's a very dangerous one. I mean, there are not a lot of countries, there are some, but there are very few that go around saying, I'm the last best hope for humanity. I'm an indispensable nation. Uh, I'm I, I'm the hope of freedom. I'm the leader of the free world. No one ever grapples with it, but that's actually dangerous talk because yes. uh, it is no accident that that's the only country that dropped atomic bombs on human beings in, in history. It's not an It's not an accident. I truly believe that. No, I agree. And again, we're talking with Danny Sherson, whose new book is A True History of the United States. And uh, I feel, you know, it also, just personal observation, 
you can believe what you and I both believe about the danger of thinking you're exceptionalist. And you can still love this country without thinking we're not, you know, I do love this country, but I think we're made up of human beings with flaws. I think we have national flaws. I think our uh, our drive for empire is a deep character defect. But, you know, this is why I think your your uh, a description of the pilgrims is important. Because if you really think you're building the new Jerusalem on earth, then anybody who might stand in your way, even if they're a saint, uh, you know, uh, a family of ducks crossing the road, whoever it is, you have a, you should exterminate them. This is exactly the way ISIS thinks. You should exterminate them because nothing's more important than building God's heaven on earth. And, and, and so I think we really need to explore that strain in ourselves and remove it. Um, so the next area where I, that, that really, and it's all good. I mean, I'm just picking out things that, that uh, really I thought were impor- uh, good to discuss. Uh, what drove the uh, sudden bellicosity of American military might towards the end of the 19th century you're talking about? Uh, why cheer on the war? And I believe we're talking about the Philippine War here, but I could be wrong. As usual, there's no simple answer, uh, but they're much cultural as political. Then you go into, indeed, one factor that seemingly drove the rush to war was a prevailing American insecurity about the citizens' collective manhood and masculinity and then you know freud would have a field day with some of the teddy roosevelt speeches you quote you quote there you know he'd he almost said we're going to thrust our way into the you know all this imagery of like you know dial it back fella but um but that is too i think you start if you, if you think of a country's formation starting with this messianic quality and then this if you don't drive for God wants you manifest destiny to conquer the West and exterminate the peoples there and God wants you to push forward into the world and if you don't you're not really a man and of course the country is run entirely by men at this point or virtually um, it is you, you, the pathology is just progressing and not, not in a good way, right? I, I think this is an important point. You know, a lot of people will say, and I think it's a, you know, I think we were always an empire, except that we were a land-based settler colonial empire. But around 1898 or a little before, we start going overseas uh, and seizing the Philippines, Caribbean islands, etc. And this is considered by some to be the point we become an empire. Um, well, we become a different kind of empire, and I do think that there was a pathology that drove a lot of this. And some other historians like Jackson Lears uh, has written about this. And then uh, I forget the author, but uh, she wrote a book called Fighting for, for American Manhood, making the argument that the Spanish-American War and the Philippine War and the rush to grab colonies was driven largely by that. But that has to tie to the frontier mythology. you know. There, and, and the frontier mythology is still with us. I mean, watch a Western, right? Look at, I mean, uh, Americans some of the most red-blooded, self-styled, patriotic ones still dress, according to the mythology, in Walmart. I mean, this idea of the frontier, of the cowboy, of the, you know, what makes America special is that we are a hardy people who are always reinventing ourselves on the frontier and pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. Now, that's always had a mythology. The federal government subsidized almost everything out West, just like they do today. However, when the West is closed, quote unquote, in 1890, you know, Frederick Jackson Turner writes a, f- a famous thing about how the, the West is now closed according to the 1890 census data. There's no more Native Americans that need conquering. Uh, the whole country is now settled, or at least, you know, by some folks, even though it's still pretty sparse. Um, and there was this feeling that because of the urbanization and the industrialization, and now people are working on the clock and factories, assembly lines, that that somehow we were going to lose our virility. And there is a there is a certain sexuality to a lot of the language that's used by these people. And what they are arguing is that America needs a good war in, in order to like reburnish its credentials of, of masculinity. And I'll, I'll just give one example. I went through the West Point yearbooks from the early 1900s and I flipped through all of them. And, and one of them, I can't remember the year, maybe in the book, actually the picture, I found a photo that was in the front of this West Point yearbook. And it's from that era, just after, and it's a shirtless, like ab muscled, like warrior, you know, wearing like an old Roman helmet and a sword and like all these other, like the pantheon of military heroes are like leading to each side. And it's just, 
I mean, there is a certain like homoeroticism to it. Yes, he, absolutely. And I would show it to my cadets and I would say, and I wouldn't even say anything. I said, I'm just going to let this sit here and wait for your comments. And we would have a 20 minute discussion on what does this mean? What does this tell us about that era? And I think that that's a big part of why we went overseas to keep up with the Europeans and show our masculinity. Robert Stack in the airplane movie saying to the little boy, do you like gladiator movies, Billy? You know, I mean, it's the same. It is, uh, and we can laugh about it, but the, uh, the consequences have been catastrophic. Uh, the body count has been incalculable. And so our absurdity... Uh, projected through military might, including in our country's case, nuclear weaponry, uh, could end civilization. And so, and yet we seem somehow blind to, you know, we play these scripts over and over. We're doing it now where the government is, we can't let China, we gotta be strong, we gotta be firm. There are that word, speaking of your your sexual image. We've got to be firm with China. We've got to be firm with Putin. I don't know if you saw people were saying Biden needs to punch Putin in the nose. And then uh, Senator Menendez, the you know, the corrupt guy, said, uh, no, we got to break his nose. I mean, this like pathological, you know, sexualized violence is, I think, an existential threat to humanity. Am I being too dramatic? No, I mean, because we could end the, I mean, a lot of American foreign policy then and now has been characterized by almost a schoolyard boyishness. I mean, it's, it's actually, it's, it's not been a strategic, rational, calculated policy oftentimes. It's, it's driven by insecurities and um, it, it, has a, it has like a prep school boyish feel sometimes. And, and it's amazing because that kind of language comes from presidents and senators and secretaries of state, uh, Democrat and Republican throughout history. But to show you, if I could just one quick anecdote on how pervasive this masculinity element yeah. still is. The commander of the Rangers in the Black Hawk Down incident in 1993 was Captain Steele. He becomes Colonel Steele in the 101st Airborne. And he... Uh, is eventually doesn't make general because some war crimes are committed under his command. They kill some civilians and they some speeches uh, surfaced of him basically saying not to take prisoners. Well, I heard a story, and this is secondhand, but from, well, someone who was there, that when new officers would show up to this guy's brigade and he would do his initial interview, he had like 70 pound dumbbells in the corner and he would make them, like test them, make them pick them up and see if they could curl them. But of course, the job of the officers in a counterinsurgency is, is ultimately like cerebral and strategic, like it's right, important, right, physically right. Fit, but that's not their job. But yet this colonel in the army, like who's going to be in charge of an entire district of Iraq, is posturing with this masculinity in, the, you know, we're talking in 2006 and seven. And is it any surprise that his unit was implicated in some of the most major war crimes of that war? I think it really does connect. And it, it, it drives back into American history with this idea of masculine, messianic fervor. Makes me think of Sterling Hayden and Dr. Strangelove as General D Jack D. Ripper, right? Talking about they want our precious bodily fluids. Uh, again, you know, I mean, I think uh, Terry Southern, the scriptwriter, I think he was onto something. I think he, with that character, I think he was portraying this pathological masculinity. Um, so I guess I would say just there's so much more we could talk about, Danny. And, you know, because I am. Uh, uh, history fanatic like yourself, every current sentence seems to open a door we could go through, but uh, we are running short of time. Uh, so before we go, is there anything else you would have people know about the book so that, of course, they will go out and buy it? Yeah, I would say that, um, look, if, if, if people are looking for an alternative take that is a uh, that, that most scholars have known for a long time, but maybe hasn't gotten through, but mixed in with a human and anecdotal quality. I really did try in every chapter to just highlight individuals and it's not all negative. So that's the last thing I would say. There are plenty of love letters to historical figures, some that you know, some that most don't. Uh, I try to highlight the centers and provide this human element because history is contingent on human decisions and human foibles and sometimes they're beautiful and sometimes they're tragic and i just tried to bring it to life as best i could and i think that uh hopefully people will uh, will enjoy that aspect of it 
Well, you can't be both exceptional and human, and I would, if given a choice, be human, and I would want my country to be human, and that's what you portray. So the my guest is Danny Sherson, again, Daniel Sherson, S-J-U-R-S-E-N. The book is A True History of the United States. Into, give me a second. I'll get through the subtitle. In, indigenous Genocide, Racialized Slavery, Hypercapitalism, Militarist Imperialism, and Other Overlooked Aspects of American Exceptionalism. So great job writing it, Danny. And as always, great to talk to you. Thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. We'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.